सब स्पेशल السلام عليكم كل عام وانتم بخير كويس انهم مدونا المحاضره دي عشان كل سنه وانتم طيبين وربنا يعود علينا الايام ان شاء الله واحنا بصحه وعافيه سو ذس ليكشرز اي واز سبوز تو جيف ديورينج ذا ريتن سايكل بت ات واز ميست سو اي يوزولي جيف ذس ليكشر ان تو ليكشرز بارت 1 بارت 2 This is mainly to talk about exogenous endosomites. Exogenous endosomites can come under post-catholic endosomites, bilip-associated endosomites, and post-traumatic endosomites. Today, we shall discuss post-catholic endosomites. You have to know that there are two types of post-catholic endosomites. Everyone should, should be familiar with these two types. First, acute and the chronic recurrent endosomites. I remember many years ago when I presented a case in the grand round of chronic recurrent endosomites, none of the audience knew about this topic of delayed onset chronic recurrent endosomites. Do we still have uh, many residents outside? Shall we start? As I said, there are two types of endosomites that can occur after cataract surgery. The most common type is the acute endosomites. So if we talk about exogenous endosomites as a whole, it is a serious intra it's a blinding, intraocular uh, uh, inflammation um, resulting from infection of the vitreous cavity. It often results in severe visual loss Exogenous endosomitis occurs when infecting organisms gain entry into the eye by a direct inoculation, such as from intraoculars is important. As we recently published uh, with uh, Dr. Marwan that we showed um, for, uh, that uh, prophylactic intravitreal antibiotics at the time of primary repair of cases of open globe injury in high-risk cases, and we identified these high-risk cases, uh, can significantly reduce the risk of post-traumatic endosomitis. Again, you will see the same also that prophylaxis also is important for um, uh, exogenous um, post-catholic endosomitis. So acute post-catholic um, endosomitis, this occurs shortly after surgery, after cataract surgery. Most uh, cases are seen within one and two weeks of surgery, often within few days. This is typical for the acute type. We know that cataract surgery is the most uh, common intraocular surgery. Therefore, 90% of post-operative endosomitis cases occurs following cataract surgery. If you look at the incidence, the incidence is increasing, unfortunately, and I'm going to tell you why. In the 1990s, the, the rate of endosomitis, acute endosomitis after cataract surgery was 0.087%. It increases three times up to 0.7 after year 2000. Why? So this increasing trend of end of salmitis frequency after cataract surgery was associated with the development of sutureless clear corneal incisions. First message that I want everyone in the room to know. 
that sutureless clear corneal incision is associated with high risk of endophthalmitis. They used to say that this type of incision, the wound is secure. This is not correct. With a slight pressure on the globe, you will see that the wound is leaking. So you should put sutures. Not every new things are correct, and this is one of the things that was uh, proved to be dangerous. So if you look again at the incidence, this is another study published in 2003 that showed three to four times the risk of endophthalmitis in patients who had clear corneal incisions compared to scleral tunnel incisions. So this study was another study, and there are many studies that I'm going to discuss today that shows that clear corneal incision is dangerous. Then, if we look at um, the end of sunmitis uh, in those patients who had just a cataract extraction or cataract extraction associated with anterior vitrectomy. You will do anterior vitrectomy if the cataract surgery is complicated, right? Hmm? So the, this study showed that at one year, the incidence of end of sunmitis was 0.13% after cataract section alone. And the risk increased about four times up to 0.6% if cataract section is with anterior vitrectomy. This is an important issue. That if you do anterior vitrectomy as term cataract section, you increase the risk of end of sunmitis. That means that you have to look for prophylaxis. And this is an indication to do prophylaxis that, that we shall discuss later. Now, for a known reason, it has been shown that the risk is relatively high after secondary intraocular lens implantation, 0.3%. So secondary intraocular lens implantation is associated with increasing uh, uh, incidence. So what are about the risk factors? We have to know the risk factors so that we can select, as we did with trauma in, a, in an important paper that we published some years ago, we looked at the risk factors for end of sunmitis after repair of open globe injury. And based on the identification of these risk factors, we gave prophylactic intravitreal antibiotics at the time of primary pain. So you have to know the risk factors for end of some mass of the cut surgery so that we can design prophylaxis. So the first risk factor, use of clear corneal incisions compared to scleral tunnels. And this was associated with about six-fold increase in the risk. So clear corneal incision. So what should you do? Just put a suture. Hmm? Don't leave the cornea without suturing. Now, if you look at the type of the intraocular lens, silicon intraocular lens optic material compared to acrylic was associated with increased risk. So we should not use silicon intraocular lenses. I looked at the literature. There is no reason for this. But the, the use of silicon intraocular lens was associated with increased risk about 3.3-fold compared to acrylic and focal lens. Again, as I said, surgical complication like uh, the hessens um, of the zonules or rupture of the pseudo capsule and they need to do vitrectomy. In this study, which is an important study, showed that this increased risk five times. This is another study. This is a summary of two studies. Again, they showed the same. It's, it's a, the same has been shown in many studies that clear corneal incisions are increasing the risk. Communication between the anterior segment and the vitreous due to capsular tear or significant zonulysis without vitreous loss. Elderly patients, 85 years of age or more. And this is, these two studies, they showed one common risk factor, which is non-use of intracameral cefroxine. So this study, these two studies show that if you don't use cefroxime intracameral, one milligram of end of some mites. Again, this is another study, perhaps one of the most recent published in 2015, that looked at risk factors for post-cataract end of some mites, clear coronal incision, again, clear coronal incision, without intracameral cefroxime, because in this institute they have surgeons that are using cefroxime routinely, 
and surgeons who are not using cefroxime routinely. So they found there's a non-use of cefroxime in the risk. The circapsular rupture, again, the same finding. Silicon interocular lenses, intraoperative complication. This study also showed that the serious capsule rupture was associated with 3.6 fold increase the risk. So now for everyone, now it's clear what are the risk factors for endosomitis after cataract surgery. If we know the risk factors, then we need to avoid it. Microbiology. I'm sure that everyone in the room knows that the most common source of bacteria causing endopsomitis is coming from bacteria colonizing the lead margin conjunctiva. This is very important information. Why it is important? That means that you have to look carefully at the lead margin conjunctiva and the sac, lacrimal sac, before you do cataract surgery, because this is the most common source of infection. And this has been proven in many studies, but uh, one of the most famous uh, uh, of these studies was the end of Salman's vitrectomy study that showed that about 70 percent, you know that, and, and we shall discuss later, the most common bacteria causing um, both cataract end of Salman's is coagulase negative, staphylococci, mainly staph epidermides. So this study showed that 70 percent of coagulase negative staphylococci obtained from the vitreous or anterior chamber of endosomitis patients were genetically identical to the bacteria isolated from their eyelids, which shows that this bacteria that cause the endosomitis that was isolated from the eye of patients with endosomitis are genetically the same as bacteria isolated from uh, the eyelid. That means that the ba bacteria colonizing the lead margin conjunctiva is the most common of infections, then you have to look carefully at uh, the lead margin conjunctiva. If you look at the end of some man's vitrectomy study, uh, they confirm it. You know, not, not all uh, cases of end of some are culture positive. Frequently, we see culture negative cases. This study showed that 70% of the cases of both the cataract end of some were culture positive. Gram positive, 94%. Gram negative, only 6%. So the majority are gram positive. The majority of bacteria causing both cataract and are gram positive in about 94%. And very few are gram negative. This is very important when you select empirical antibiotic treatment. Now, if you look at um, the organisms in those cases that were culture positive, 70% of the isolates where coagulase negative staphylococci predominantly staphylococcus epidermides. These are good news. Why? Because this particular bacteria is of low virulent, of, is less virulent compared to the other bacteria. Is that clear? Now, looking at more virulent bacteria like streptococcus. Streptococcus species are the most virulent bacteria that kill the eye in a few days. All the 9%. Staph aureus, 10%. Enterococcus, 2.2%. Miscellaneous gram positive, 3%. And polymicrobial infection, 9%. When we give the, when, inshallah, when I give the lecture on post traumatic endosomitis, the microbiology of post traumatic endosomitis is different. How? Post-traumatic endopsalmitis has less coagulase negative staphylococci, about 25%, based on our publication and based on previous publication. So traumatic endopsalmitis, you have less bacteria, which is less virulent. Is that clear? Now, streptococcus species are much more in traumatic endopsalmitis compared to post-traumatic endopsalmitis up to 25%. So traumatic endopsomites have more virulent bacteria. Polymicrobial infection are much more in traumatic endopsomites compared to post-traumatic endopsomites. 
Meaning that in post-traumatic end of somitis, the microbiology is more towards the virulent bacteria compared to post-traumatic end of somitis. And that's why, that's why the outcome of post-traumatic end of somitis is much better than post-traumatic end of somitis. That's why we have to look carefully for prophylaxis in post-traumatic end of somitis. Hmm? So the, the, the bacteria causing post-traumatic endosomites tends to be more aggressive, more virulent compared to post-cataract endosomites. Uh, and that's why also the guidelines to do vitrectomy, the indications to do vitrectomy that came from the end of somites vitrectomy study that dealt only with post-cataract endosomites cannot be applied to post-traumatic endosomites. Is that clear? When we talk later about indication of vitrectomy in both the cataract end of somitis based on the guidelines that came from the end of somitis vitrectomy study, these guidelines are only applicable for acute both cataract end of somitis. You cannot apply it to both the traumatic end of somitis or to blip associated end of somitis. Is that clear? And this is very important because many, they did the mistake by saying, okay, but the end of somitis vitrectomy study suggested that you only do vitrectomy if the vision is only light perception, but this is only for post cataract of some mites. The data or the results are based on post cataract end of some mites and not other types of end of some mites in which the microbiology is completely different. So, the diagnostic features we always say that in the emergence room, any eye with inflammation greater than usual, post operative clinical course should be suspect of end of some mites. Don't allow a patient leaving the emergency room coming a few days after cataract surgery with a fibromous reaction hypopion, even you see a red reflex. This is not usual. So any inflammation which is more than expected should be suspected as end of some months. And if you want to observe the patient, the observation should be over hours, not days. Don't send the patient home and bring him next day. So any inflammation more than usual should be suspected to having end of some mites. Of course, the symptoms can be pain, red eye, discharge, decreased vision. Lady swelling, conjunctiva and coronal edema, and two chamber cells, and fibrin, hypopion, vitreous inflammation, poor red reflex, retinal vasculitis is a feature of end of some mites and the hemorrhoids. In the end of some mites, cells, the most common symptom was blurred vision, followed by red eye, Bain was less frequent, swan lid was less frequent. Look careful at the eye. Any inflammation, more than expected, you have to treat the patient as endophthalmitis until proved otherwise. This is an example of a patient who came. This patient came to the emergency room with early infection. He was sent to home with steroids. And he came with this picture. The entire chamber was full of pus. Now, um, if you suspect um, post cataract end of somitis, then you have to do cultures. Before you give antibiotic empirically, because we, we tend to treat empirically, but before we inject the intra, um, vitreal antibiotics, you have to get samples for culture. Now, you can get samples from the aqueous or vitreous. If you, if you get a sample only from aqueous, this is a big mistake. Because frequently the aqueous is negative in the presence of positive culture uh, from the vitreous. So if you want to get one sample, get it from vitreous, not from aqueous. It's very rarely that the aqueous will be positive and vitreous is negative. So we always get samples from vitreous. We see patients managed uh, outside and they come with, after having samples from the aqueous humor only, and this is a big mistake. So in the end of some months vitrectum study, vitreous samples yielded positive cultures more than aqueous samples, and were more likely to be the only source of positive culture. How you get a vitreous biopsy? The easiest in the emergency room is to insert a needle, 27 to 22 gauge needle, three millimeters behind the, behind the limbus and aspirate. This is the easiest that can be adapting to any hospital. However, this is a very crude way 
to do um, to get uh, the sample, the best way is to use automated vitrectomy instrument. There are available uh, vitrectomy instruments that uh, you attach the aspiration tubing to a syringe. You activate the, the vitreous scatter, and the assistant just pull on the syringe to aspirate concentrated vitreous biopsy. The advantage here of using vitrectomy instrument is that you reduce traction on the retina. Now, you can get the vitreous sample during vitrectomy. If you elected to do therapeutic bars of vitrectomy, then at the start of the procedure, we get a concentrated displacement in a serum. Those who assisted me in vitrectomy, I always get us um, a, a, a vitreous sample for research from diabetic patients and so on. So before we, um, uh, the infusion is on, we keep infusion off, then we activate the vitrectomy instrument and the nurse will suck on the syringe connected to the aspiration tubing to get a sample and then we activate the infusion. So you get concentrated specimen in a syringe. Or in addition, I used to send the vitrectomy cassette that, co that collect all the flow that came from the eye to the microbiology where do they do centrifugation of the contents and the billet is cultured. It has been shown that culturing this material is even more important than getting a sample in the syringe. Or you can pass the, this material through a filter and then you cut the filter into pieces and culture it. So one study showed that culturing the vitrectomy cassette contents, as I described, significantly increase the chances of obtaining positive culture compared with culturing vitreous sample obtained by aspiration using needle and syringe. Hmm? So always we send the cassette to the microbiology for centrifugation and then culturing uh, the concentrated material. You have to use gram stain and, and stain for fungi like games stain. Culture should be aerobic, anaerobic, and fungal, and do also antibiotic sensitivity. Anaerobic culture should be kept for at least two weeks because some bacteria like propylene bacterium acne, anaerobic bacteria, they take long time to grow in culture. Fungal culture should be kept for several weeks. Now, with the ability of um, uh, uh, molecular biology, uh, BCR techniques have been used, and it has been shown that many patients who are culture negative with conventional culture were positive with BCR, and uh, especially in chronic endosalmitis. It has been shown also that the previous use of intravitreal antibiotics did not affect the ability of BCR to amplify DNA. So uh, molecular biology such BCR is an important adjunct to conventional cultures. How is the treatment? As I said, we get a culture and we wait for, for the results, but at the same time, we should inject intravitreal antibiotics empirically. So that means that we should use a combination that can cover both gram positive and gram negative. As I said, gram positive isolates accounts for about 94% and gram negative only for 6%. So we have to combine uh, 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 an antibiotic to cover gram positive like vancomycin. This is the best choice, one milligram point one ml. And ciftazidim to cover gram negative isolates 2.25 milligram point one ml. In the past, we were using to cover gram negative isolates aminoglycosides such as amicacin and gentamicin, but now we, we, do, we never use it because of toxicity. It causes macular infarction. Corticosteroids also, because you know that you have inflammation. You need to kill the bacteria. At the same time, we need to control inflammation. So frequently we use, um, we always we use uh, baroocular steroids, frequent topical steroids after surgery, and also sometimes we use systemic uh, steroids. Some, they use intravitreal dexamethasone, 400 microgram, 0.1 ml. However, some studies show that uh, the use of intravitreal steroids did not improve the outcome in these patients. Now, for many years, there was a debate regarding Barzman vitrectomy. And for many years, before the data that came from the end of the vitrectomy study, I was always in the opinion that we have to do early vitrectomy in patients with dense vitreous involvement. If you see that the vitreous is full of bus, no red reflex, this is an indication to do uh, uh, early vitrectomy. 
And um, I still remember one of the first uh, discussions that I had here in the Grand Round after I came to the kingdom. And um, there was an American colleague, and they were discussing a case of end of Samaitis that ended with um, evisceration. Then I, I raised my hand and said, why you didn't do vitrectomy earlier than this? Why, you are, you, why did you wait until you, you had to, to remove the eye? And he was shouting and said, I am, I am an injector, I am not a vitrector. I am an injector, not a vitrector. And of course he was completely wrong. And he was telling later that if we tell the people here that I'm doing, vit that we do, vit that this patient is vitrectomy, they will call you even at night to come to see the patient to do vitrectomy. So th that was a wrong attitude. But then recently, the end of some months vitrectomy study showed that vitrectomy is useful on those patients who present, as I said, with severe end of somitis, with uh, heavy vitreous involvement. So the, the study showed that uh, if, if the patient presenting with vision only light perception, early vitrectomy increased the chances to, to have better vision, 20, 40 uh, or better chances is increased um, th three times, and the chances to have better vision um, uh, more 20, 100 or more increased two times, and there's 50% uh, decrease in the frequency of visual loss. So this study shows that for sure, severe cases need early vitrectomy. If the vision is hand motion or better, there was no difference between those patients who received the vitrectomy or just intravitreal antibiotics. Then an example of patients that I operated many years ago, this is a preoperative, dense vitreous involvement, no reflex, no reflex, and postoperatively after vitrectomy and intravitreal antibiotics. Patients who have diabetes, a special group, there was a trend that even if the vision is good in a diabetic patient, the benefit of vitrectomy is more in diabetic patients. So if you have a diabetic patient, don't wait for vision light perception. Even if the vision had the motion or better, there is beneficial effect of doing early vitrectomy in diabetic patients. Systemic antibiotics. One of the objectives of this study is to look also at the value of systemic antibiotics. The study concluded that systemic antibiotics did not affect the outcome, and you don't need systemic antibiotics. However, the choice of systemic antibiotics in this study was very strange. They used combination of amikacin. What is the spectrum of amikacin? And ceftazidim? Both of them are gram-negative. And this, the, there was a lot of... Uh, criticism for this, a lot of letters were written saying that, but perhaps if you use vancomycin, because most of the bacteria are gram-positive, in addition to ceftazidim, the outcome might be different. But anyhow, with these two antibiotics used for systemic use, and again, ceftazidim, there was no difference. So as I said here, intravenous antibiotics used in this study were not optimal. Now, there are uh, uh, several studies they looked at the risk factors for poor visual outcome in patients with end of surgery. So if you have initial vision of only light perception, this is a predictor of poor outcome, and this is the most important predictor of poor outcome, poor initial vision, light perception only. Older age, history of diabetes, coronal infiltrate or ring ulcer. You know, coronal infiltrate or ring ulcer is a sign of an aggressive uh, bacteria. Abnormal intraocular pressure, small pupil after maximal dilation, afferent pupillary defect, rubiosus iridis, open posterior capsule, absent red reflex, inability to see any retinal vessels by induct of some muscle, which is a sign of dense vitreous involvement. So these are signs of um, uh, poor outcome. Now, the, the studies also looked at the microbiologic factors and visual outcome. So a good visual outcome is seen in 84% of patients in whom gram-positive coagulase negative sulcoxi are isolated. Why is that? Because this is the least virulent organism. 84% had good outcome. If you go to staph aureus, 
50%. If you go straight to Kopkai, only 30%. In Tiri Kopkai, 14%. Gram negative bacteria, about 60%. So the worst outcome, as you can see here, was the streptococci and enterococci. So this is another study that showed, um, uh, that looked also at the risk factor for poor visual outcome, again. Poor initial visual acuity was a risk factor for poor outcome, older age diagnosis more virulent organisms, this already has been shown. And the study showed that cases with streptococcus infection were 10 times more likely to have poor final visual acuity than coagulase negative cephalococci. So again, streptococcus infection is bad news. So prevention, as I said, if we know the risk factors, then we can talk about prevention. So pre-existing conditions such as conjunctivitis, peripheritis, or Dicrocystitis should be treated. The most common bacteria causing both operative endosomitis are expected to come from patients' conjunctiva and eyelids. So we have to examine the patient carefully before surgery. How about the use of preoperative and postoperative topical antibiotics? There is no strong proof that the routine use of preoperative and postoperative antibiotics is useful. The same also for subconjunctival antibiotics. But the most important, the most important prophylactic measure is the preoperative use of tropical 5% bovidine iodine in the conjunctival before surgery. This is the most important prophylactic measure. Careful washing the conjunctival sac with bovidine iodine. If you go to our emergency room, you will see that even if you want to remove a corneal suture, you have to wash the conjunctiva with bovidin iodine because of the risk of having end of sulmitis after removal of corneal sutures. We have seen few cases. Since that time, it is written in the emergency room, before you remove a corneal suture, you have to, to wash the conjunctival sac with bovidin iodine. So the incidence also was reduced by suturing a corneal incision. So sutureless coronal incision should not be done. You have to suture the cornea. And also this study showed that if you put a drop of within iodine after closure, this will also reduce the risk. Again, um, many studies showed that the use of intracameral cefroxime, one milligram, 0.1 ml, um, uh, reduce the risk of end of sulmitis. This has been shown in many studies, but as I said, I don't agree that we need to use it routinely, but we use it at high-risk cases, as I discussed in the introduction. Again, more recent studies show that moxifloxacin injection into the anterior chamber at the conclusion of cataract surgery is also reducing the risk. Then we'll move to chronic end of some mess after cataract surgery, which is the one which is frequently missed. I just had a phone call yesterday from one of uh, our colleagues in two segment who was discussing me, with me one case. So these cases are present, but are frequently missed. So what is typical for chronic end of some mess after cataract surgery? that it presents one month or more after cataract surgery and may present for months thereafter. Then you have to suspect. It follows Bissur, uh, cataract extraction with Bissur chamber and ocular lens. There is persistent low-grade inflammation. It can masquerade as granuloma cerviitis. You see mutton fat KPs in these patients. And what is typical here is that if you give the patient typical steroids, inflammation subsides, if you taper and discontinue the steroids, inflammation recurs. So this is the reason that you should suspect kind of somitis that is transient response to steroids, and then when you stop the steroids, inflammation will recur. So in the many cases are misdiagnosed as a trial post-operative inflammation. It can develop, as the patient that my colleague was discussing with me yesterday, 
it can develop after Young laser capsulotomy. This is another uh, point that you should suspect it. And this is, can be due to liberation of previously loculated organisms. The first organism that was described was Propylobacterium acne. It's an aerobic bacteria of low virulence, but many bacteria, low virulent bacteria, can cause chronic endosomites. So typically, it is indolent, gradually progressive, low grade granulomatous uveitis weeks to months after cataract surgery, response to corticosteroid therapy, at least initially. And uh, what are also as, uh, as a sign, as a typical sign, is presence of white blacks, I'm going to show you many pictures, within the peripheral capsular bag or between the endocular lens and posterior capsule. And these white blacks represent colonies of organisms, sometimes mix it with residual lens material. And this is present in about 40 to 100% of the cases. This is one of the cases, one of the earliest cases, and I, I, I presented here in the Grand Round many years ago that had this, it was called my Mycobacterium shillonwai subspecies abscess. So you can see the white capsular plaques. Uh, uh, and this is another case. This is another case. So um, in about 30 to 80%, you expected to see mutton fat Cratic precipitates. Hypopion can be seen in up to 60% of the cases. And this is an example of the mutton fat cratic precipitates. Hypopion. This is another patient that I managed some years ago with hypopion and fibrinous material. And then another patient, this is a classic case. What are these? Mutton fat kippies, and what are these? The whitish plaques. Hmm? So these whitish plaques represent colonies of the bacteria mixed with lens material. You can have also granulomatous deposits on the intercular lens, vitritis, conjunctival injection, in most of the cases. These are the typical granulomatous deposits that you see on the intercular lenses. There's a big list of uh, low virulent bacteria that can cause this. Of course, the most famous is Propylobacterium acne, but uh, any low virulent bacteria can cause this uh, end of sunlight. So Propylobacterium acne, these are anaerobic, gram-positive, polymorphic bacillus that demonstrate extremely low growth characteristic. As I said, you have to keep the culture for two weeks because it's very slowly growing in culture. It is often difficult uh, to culture, This is a patient that uh, I operated. When we um, do the surgery to, um, to clear this infection, in most of the cases, we need to remove the bisturic capsule. And then you have to send this capsule to the lab for staining. And this patient, you can see the gram positive uh, bacilli here. Perhaps this is sometimes the only way uh, to, uh, to show the bacteria. Now, what are the treatment options? Very important. You can give only intravitreal antibiotics. Hmm? You can do vitrectomy plus intravitreal antibiotics. You can do vitrectomy plus partial capsulectomy. You excise the part of the capsule containing the plaques plus intravitreal antibiotics, and you keep the intraocular lens. Or you can do vitrectomy, and you remove the whole capsule. You give intravitreal antibiotics and you remove this intraocular lens, or you put a new one. Hmm? Propylobacterium acne is sensed to vancomycin. Um, and then I summarized two big studies, two big series, to look at the outcome after different lines of treatment. So the first study uh, had 36 eyes. The second study had 25 eyes, total 61 eyes. So if you use antibiotics only, 93% risk of recurrence. So, antibiotics alone are not enough. Then, if you do vitrectomy with antibiotics, 50% risk of recurrence. If you combine vitrectomy with excision of the obscure capsule that contains the plaques, keeping the endocular lens, that, that is my first line of treatment. 
I do vitrectomy. I excised like this patient that I showed you. Uh, he responded very nice and is having 20-20 vision after some year, many years of follow-up. So if you, if you do, my approach is to do vitrectomy. I excise the posterior capsule that contains the plaques, give intravitreal antibiotics, or even sometimes I inject in the bag. So the risk of recurrence is 26%. But if you do vitrectomy and you excise the whole capsule and you remove the intraocular lens, the risk of recurrence is 0%. So my suggestion here is that you try first by doing vitrectomy, you excise the posterior capsule containing the plaque to inject the antibiotics. If the inflammation recurs, then you have to remove the whole capsule and the intraocular lens. So in conclusion, propionopactium acne endosomitis after cataract section presents many diagnostic and therapeutic challenges, but I am sure that now, after this lecture, it, it would not be difficult to make the diagnosis. Any patients that have inflammation, significant inflammation, granulomatous inflammation, one month or more after cataract surgery, especially after YAG capsulotomy, you have to suspect it. If you suspect it, you will not miss it. So um, this infection should be considered in a pseudophagic patient with chronic intraocular inflammation, white intracapsular plaques, mutton fat cratic precipitates, hypopion, vitrite may be present. There is a temporary response to corticosteroid, and typically, again, you give steroids, inflammation uh, subsides, you stop the steroids, inflammation will recur. We should keep the, the sample for at least two weeks to grow the bacteria. As I said, a reasonable treatment to choice include vitrectomy and intravitreal antibiotics with either partial capsulectomy or total capsulectomy and IOL exchange or removal. In patients with recurrent inflammation, vitrectomy, total capsular bag removal, intravitreal antibiotics, IOL exchange or removal is, is successful. The visual outcome is often good. Now, just to show you, this is a study that was published in 2012, and this is just a summary of what I just said. They compared um, uh, a series of patients with acute post-cardiac endosomitis versus chronic endosomitis. So they defined acute endosomitis six weeks or less after surgery, hmm? and the chronic endosomitis more than six weeks after surgery. So they have a total of 118 patients uh, included 26 delayed onset cases and eight, 92 acute onset cases. And then they looked at the differences between the two groups. If you look at um, uh, presenting visual acuity of 5 to 100 or less, uh, talking about both vision, huh? this both vision was present in 31 in the chronic cases and about 90% in the acute cases, and this is expected. Usually, chronic cases, they come with a better vision compared to acute cases. Hypopion, and on, uh, as I said, hypopion is a feature of both. But hypopion was seen in only 50% of chronic cases and 80% of acute cases. The most common isolates were propionobacterium acne in the chronic cases, and as expected, in the acute cases, coagulase negative sulfur which type will be associated with a better visual outcome? Chronic or acute? The chronic cases. So they looked at a uh, good vision, uh, uh, visual outcome of 200, 20, 100 or better, was achieved in 90% of the chronic cases and 56% in the acute cases. In delayed onset cases, the intraocular lens was removed or exchanged in 73% of the cases. So frequently, we need to remove the intraocular lens. So that will be the last slide. Next lecture, I have to give end of somitis lecture two. I'm going to discuss glaucoma or blib-related end of somitis and post-traumatic end of somitis. Thank you very much for your attention. Do you have any question? We have uh, five times, five minutes.
تفضل يا احمد I don't know because uh, I don't think there are any uh, study that compared uh, these two antibiotics. But both studies showed that cefuroxime and moxifloxine are effective. Can you please help me? This one, Doctor. Yeah, that's it. Oh, sorry. Thank you. I will check your. That's okay. <laughs> no, <laughs> maybe the um, the data will be affected. That's okay. <laughs> it's available on my. Device. Ah, okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> Copy that. Uh, yes. And try it this morning. Shall I begin?
Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, to all of you, Eid Mubarak. I hope you had a good time. Uh, today is uh, a grand night that is sandwiched between Eid holiday and the summer recess. Um, I'm very thankful to the people who came forward, my colleagues who came forward, to give presentations because this grand night was canceled at the last minute. So I'm very, very grateful to Dr. Rubio, Dr. Yepes, Dr. Leila Jassim, Dr. Mora, and if there's time, I'm also going to present you a little case. I will also give you the quiz because the quiz was also canceled, so stay tuned because I hope that you will learn a lot. Um, I would like to call my friend and colleague, Dr. Marcos Rubio, retina specialist, to start the presentation. Thank you, Marco. Good afternoon to everybody. Uh, thank you for the uh, nice invitation to, to share the grand round. Actually, it's my first grand round here, so I try to make it interesting. I would like to show, you, uh, so, so show to you some small study we conducted in this very interesting disease. I will try to introduce you in this disease also, and there with the characteristics, and we try to find if it can be possible to learn something from, from that. So. Uh, basically, I'm going to talk about the choroidal thickness in pachycoroid neovasculopathy and the therapeutic indications for that. Which is what we call it pachycoroid, uh, pachycoroid diseases. Uh, this is one of the two new described, uh, newly discovered uh, diseases and two old friends of us. Uh, there's uh, been uh, a group it, uh, they joined all together because they have the, the seems they have the same characteristics, and also they seems they, they have the same um, physiopathology. And I want to introduce you in the two new ones, which is the, call it the pachycoroid uh, pigment epithelopathy and the pachycoroid neovasculopathy. And the other one is uh, well known of the, uh, any retinal specialist, is the, our famous central serosclerosis retinopathy. Um, for AMD experts, uh, there is uh, one uh, subtype of uh, AMD, it's called it uh, polyploidal choroidal vasculopathy. And we'll try to uh, get uh, 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 information about that. All these diseases have in common that they had a thick choroid. Okay? This is the, what they, 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 they join uh, all the physiopathology together. So, what is the way we call it? The, the first one is the pachycoroid pigment epithelopathy. We're talking about a, a phenotype of disease that is only caused with uh, anomalies in the retinal pigmentario of the, uh, the retina, uh, the, uh, the retinal pigmentario of the uh, epithelial pigmentario of the retina that happens beneath a thick choroid. These changes is very similar to what we call the choroidal uh, uh, choroidal uh, serous, uh, uh, choroidopathy, but without subretinal fluid. It's really we want to find in this disease uh, 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 pigment epithelial detachment, and all the characteristics, all the alterations of the RPA, you are going to be seen very well with the fundus autofluorescence. The most frequent uh, way to find this disease is look to the fellow eye of patients with a previous uh, CSCR. And this disease is mostly asymptomatic. Another disease we have to talk about in relation with that is what we call the pachycoroid neovasculopathy. It's a patients that they have these changes that we explained uh, in the disease that we, we shown before, uh, but they have some uh, uh, neovascular colorization type one, which occurs in the, in the, on the, on the areas of the increased choroidal thickness. This. This, uh, this uh, neovascular uh, network that is here uh, is uh, happening because probably uh, there's a theory that says the, the chronic uh, RPA changes and the uh, chronic uh, epithelial the, the, the detachment of the or the detachment of the epithelial pigmentary of the retina can lead to the growth of the uh, subretinal the, the sub subrepia endothelial cells. Why is important that? Because it seems that all this pathology 
can be associated with the CR, no, CRCR, with the epipenia of the ovary, and all these changes, finally, they will lead to uh, polypoidal, uh, polypoidal choroidal vasculopathy. These are, these are the, to remind, the three types of, of neovascular membranes. We are talking about that one, we uh, call it uh, occult, because uh, when we describe the neovascular membranes, we don't have the OCD, we only have a geography. Uh, the, the, the pattern that we show in the geography was an occult pattern. And this is uh, an example of, of, of the disease. This is a patient with a normal retina with a thick choroid. Compared to the choroidal thickness, so for the choroidal thickness with a normal choroidal thickness, is well above 300 microns. So this is a patient with a normal retina with a thick choroid. In this patient, we can categorize it as a pigmentary, uh, uh, pachycoroid pigmentary epitheliopathy. When we see a thick choroid, we also see some DEP, the, the, the detachment of the pigmentary of the retina, and also, as I told you on the first thing in geography, you see these changes on the RPA. And this can lead, if there's a neovascularization, to what we call it the polypoidal vasculopathy, which is just a subretinal fluid, you have a nevascular membrane seen in the autofluorescent and also a thick choroid. This is uh, one of the cases that have been described in the first series of uh, choroidal uh, the vasculopathy, the nevasculopathy. These uh, changes, uh, the characteristic you see in the fundus of the patient is the loss of the tessellation and also not so few changes uh, on, the, on the macular area, uh, probably a loss of the, of the foveal reflex. But on the OCT, you see clearly there is a subretinal fluid with small uh, de detachment of the pigmentary of the retina over area of thicket choroid, local thicket choroid vessels. To demonstrate this uh, neovascular membrane, you can show the, uh, the, um, uh, infra the infrared image, the angiography, and the uh, ICG then show you this uh, hyperperme hyperpermeability of the choroidal vessels. And where, where we talk about all these diseases can ultimately finally uh, finish as a polypoidal, cho cho um, po um, polypoidal cho choroidal vasculopathy, this is a case of uh, uh, neovascul um, polypoidal neovasculopathy that happens with the time and the fluid changes, and this you see here, this finger glove sign, which is typical from the poly, for the poly of the patient. So this is the patient who evolves from the um, polypoidal, uh, polypoidal vasculopathy to a polypoidal choroidal vasculopathy. Let's go back a little bit. So how we uh, objectively assess the CMB activity? Usually, classically, we assess activity of the CMB clinically every day in the clinic, seeing it is a resident retinal hemorrhage or the presence of the retinal fluid or the presence of the retinal fluid. Seems easy. But let me show you some information probably most of you, you don't know, which is I think is important to know how objectively we assess the, the, this uh, activity of the CMB. Let's look at the CAT trial. CAT trial is a trial that uh, most of the people involved in the retina know. There's a prior try to compare Bevacizumab and Ranizumab uh, monthly or PRN uh, in uh, AMD. This patient in the clinical trial was designed as a full fluid design. What it means that? Because any patient has any sign of interretinal fluid is going to be treated on. Okay? At, due to the characteristics at the time that we conduct the, the CAT trial, this was OCD guidance using most of the, most of 40% of the patients of the, of the investigator were using a time domain OCT. And you see clearly it's an image of time domain OCT and you see the same patient with the standard domain OCT. And so clearly here there is no signs of activation and in this patient clearly the sign of activation in the retinal fluid. So it depends on the machine you use, you can be able to assess if there is activity or not. But also uh, another thing that probably most of you don't know is this, uh, um, this uh, feature, but we thought some time ago there was uh, interretinal fluid. Now it's called it autoretinal tubulation. It's a way of retinal degeneration. 
patients in CAT trial that they have interretinal fluid, these lesions were classified as active and we treated on. So you can understand why CAT trial compared to the, to the trials that we do, to uh, the pivotal trials we do to approval of the ranithumab in AND, were so speaking uh, low results. It depends on the machine you use, you get some results or other results. So we talk a little bit about CIA, Taiwan CMB, which is a, a quite a strange uh, type of CMB. It's not really, it's usually it's not associated with retinal hemorrhages. What you see in these patients is uh, also the lack of drusen, and there is few or absence of interretinal fluid, which is the most frequent sign of activation in a, C a, C a neovascular uh, CMB, but usually it came with the subretinal fluid. Another striking uh, finding about these uh, neovascular membranes is visual acuity for these uh, membranes are way ahead better that then we are used to, to see in other types of CMB. And also, if you treat these membranes, you will see that they are very resistant, very, uh, you, you cannot achieve a good result, no matter what uh, how many injections you are going to use. So we and my, co me and my colleagues from Barcelona, we uh, conduct a pilot study uh, of subversion retrospective consecutive case series of 18 patients, 18 eyes, with unilateral, uh, um, uh, pachycoroid neovasculopathy, treated with anti-VGF uh, in a prorenata uh, way. We use uh, the fellow eye of the patient as a control eye, and we study, we assess the colloidal thickness with sweat source of CT for 12 months in all these areas of patients. This is the, 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 the result is going to be published any day soon. And we talk about patient demographics. We, uh, the age of the patients is a little bit younger than the, the patients we use it to see on AMD patients. Also, the gender, there's a difference with the AMD studies because it's mostly males, 61% uh, of them are males. Baseline uh, visual acuity for all the group is 65 letters. More or less is a 20, 100 equivalent, SNL equivalent, which is a little bit higher than is usually for patients with AMD, is a 2200. One of the, the, the things that, uh, that keeps you your attention is in eight patients of the, the, uh, in eight patient, the 18 patients we analyze, they have previous CSA, previous to, the, to, the, to develop the neovascular membrane. And also, the number of injections we use in this patient is 7.5 injections over 12 months. So it means some patients, they use low injections, and some other patients, they use injections every visit. We use Ranithibulab, Afilibertheb, and also we, in some of them, we switch during the period of the study the drug. So why to use sweat source OCT? As you may know, sweat source OCT is a new device that can use a laser, and the, the, with this laser, it's a Tunavi laser, you can get higher penetration compared with the spectral domain OCT. And also, they allows you to do OCT angiography, which show you very nice images in the next uh, slides. And with, with sweat source OCT and the software, we achieve it a measurement, a good measurement of the corridor thickness. We just measure the subcoidal the subphobial corridor thickness, and also using the editor style uh, grid, uh, we also measure the corridor thickness over the macular area. The, as you may know, all this uh, machine is brand new, and uh, we are one of the people who was leading to conduct the software. So uh, I can tell you by <laughs> Tr truly that it was really difficult to use the automatic cementation to that. So we use the automatic cementation, I will show you in the pictures, but you have to manually adjust slide by slide the, the, so that you can measure very well the choroidal. And this is the method we use, okay? See this nice cut of the OCT? One of the nice things about the spread of the, the sweat source OCT makes longer lines, it's 12, 12 millimeters lines, and you see clearly, we measure the choroidal, and this measurement get translated into choroidal thickness over this macular area. You always remind about uh, the same that we used in the, in the editor study. So, looking to the visual acuity of this group, we inject the patient, we start in 65 uh, line, uh, letters uh, baseline, and after 12 months, 
only 72 dry deserts. There's no sin significantly, uh, statistical significant change, improvement in visual acuity uh, during the whole study. It means the patient has seen more or less the same. Vision improved in 13 eyes, but also worsened in five eyes. This is the evolution, quite clear, stability of the visual acuity during all the study. But let's look at the, the corridor thickness of the group of the, they, they have the disease, the, the, the pachycoroid nevoscopathy. We started with a thick choroid. As I told you, choroids more than 300 microns is uh, called a thick choroid, okay? So the baseline for the group is the 317 uh, uh, microns. And during the study, we achieved to reduce the, 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 the corridor, so called the subfobia corridor thickness in, uh, in, 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 in the patients. And it's a significant, it was uh, statistically significant. Also, the mean change of, of, of thickness of the, of, the, of the choroid during the 12 months was 44 microns. It means, more or less, a decrease of 16% of the, of the so, uh, sophobia corridor thickness. Image, same control, everything. Look, it's normal in all the study. This is a graphic that shows very well the, the, the decrease on the thickness of the corridor in the treated eye compared to the fellow eye who maintains a normal thickness. Also, we studied the correlation between the visual acuity, the, the base corrected visual acuity, and the, 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 the subphobial uh, corridor thickness, but there was no correlation. Uh, uh, the, the group is only 18 patients, okay? So we, we cannot uh, get a lot of uh, information for that because uh, with a small number of patients, if there's a huge decrease of visual acuity, they cannot tell the, 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 the results of the group. But what we think that is striking finding is that it's a high correlation between the number of injections we're doing and the changes to the uh, subphobial corridor thickness. So we're injecting the patients, we're maintaining the vision, we're doing something. What's the limitation of the study? As I told you, it's a retrospective study, it's a short study, and also in a new level of group of patients. These patients are not really easy to find. But uh, if you can get a good uh, bunch of, 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 of these patients, it's good to study. And also, the findings have to be confirmed. We are on the way to do that with a prospective study with more recruitment. Let me show you two cases. This uh, lady with a uh, uh, pachycoroidal nevoscolopathy, you see clear the choroidal, these big vessels, pachy vessels, they call it, and this choroidal thickness here. And look at this OCT and geography, okay? Look at the, nev the network of vessels right there, here. After one year of treatment, we find more or less the same choroid, as I told you, it doesn't change so much. But, no, sorry. But look how the reduced, the, the, the ne capillary network, or the neovascular uh, capillary network is reduced on the OCT and geography. Another case, the choroid, uh, these uh, APR anomalies, there's uh, the subretinal fluid. Look at the peak network of neo vessels around that. And finally, a little thinner choroid, not so big change. But look at the neo vessels, how the neo vessels is being uh, slow, uh, small. So, in conclusion, in patients with a uh, uh, um, pachycoroid nevoscolopathy, choroid thickness measurement can be used to assess activity added to other, other OCT features. OCT and geography could help to differentiate between DAP, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the detachment of epithelial, the, the detachment of epithelial, the, the, the detachment of epithelial pigmentary of the retina, at type 1 CMB, because of the presence of neural vessels on the OCT. And it seems that the anti-VGF treatment seems to reduce the permeability of the blood vessels. So the take home message for this is uh, AMD treatments, all these uh, new diseases, 
We cannot uh, work uh, with that. It's like a one size uh, fit all. It's uh, not the best approach to manage all the nevascular membranes. You see activity, you inject it. You don't see activity, you just uh, observe. And also, I think that the, the better characterization of follow-up strategies uh, on these diseases can be led to better outcomes in CMB-driven diseases. And thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Rubio. We'll open the floor to questions. Dr. Thank you very much, Marco. Very nice, concise. I would like also to add for the resident's sake that pachycoroid, as uh, Dr. Marco said, that it is uh, a thick choroid. And yeah. another cause, is, uh, plus he mentioned is also the inflammatory, the one we use yeah, to VKH and the multifocal choroidas and the others. My question to you, Marco, you are not using bifavizumab in, in back home in your uh, it's in, not Europe approved it's not in Europe, uh, during to the, to the regulations, it's not allowed to use bevacizumab because we use we have two approved uh, drugs. There's okay. uh, aflibertheb and ranithumab. My personal experience, it doesn't matter. So we were very happy to try to change all ranithumab patients to aflibertheb to see some changes. And to be honest, uh, there is. Uh, you cannot assess that the, the, in, the, in the, we study also the, this in the, in the study. You will, when, when this uh, being published, you will review that. Yeah. But uh, it's not a few difference. So it seems both uh, drugs are working the same way. Yeah. We don't use Avastin on these yeah, cases. No, because uh, even in public uh, hospitals, because of, I'm asking because of the cost, it is. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. Even in public hospital, it's uh, not. So really in well. Spain, the cost is not a problem. It's all wrong for the Spaniards, we pay them with taxes, but it's not yeah. a problem with the cost. But uh, uh, these drugs, is becoming cheap and cheap from time to time. And so I hope in the next future, it will be new drugs available also that can help us to reduce the burden. Because something is very short time I will dedicate, but the main problem with that is not the cost of the drugs. Now that we're facing problems with the burden of the treatments, because we cannot put our patients back. As I show you, um, we are maintaining the visuality for the patient. It means every year that happens, you have more and more patients because the only way for all these patients to stop injecting is to die. So it means we are collecting more and more patients. And the, better, the, 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 the more you try to do the be, be, better uh, treatments, the more patients you're going to collect, and the more problems you, uh, you will have to the burden of the better injections. You didn't do any polydynamic therapy for the PCB? Uh, we do, we do in PCB. We do in PCB, but I don't show you this case in PCB. We, use at, we usually add the, the, the PCB with the with the with the, the photodynamic therapy also, but uh, if you have, it's a short time. But uh, if also we are using for choroidal uh, for chronic uh, CSCR. We use it also uh, low flow uh, with uh, photodynamic therapy with very nice results. So it seems that uh, if you put in anti vgr drugs, you just stabilize them, but you don't stop. Okay, that's the problem. If you put the injections, you do uh, the, on a regular basis, you maintain the patient with the same vision, but you don't stop the, the problem. Polypoidal uh, vasculopathy, it's a very, as you know, it's a very um, uh, aggressive disease. The scarring and the, the bleeding, and the, the, it makes a lot of, of uh, the visual disease for the patients. So in these patients, I think it's, it's, a, it's, it's a good idea to add uh, the photodynamic therapy. But the main group has studied that is the Everest study with the uh, people from Singapore, because as you may know, uh, polypoidal, uh, polypoidal choroidal vasculopathy, it's very, very frequent in, in, in Asia. So that's the reason, uh, for instance, um, um, Novartis doesn't up, uh, try to approve the photodynamic therapy in Japan a long time ago, because they know they have a higher uh, group of uh, polypoidal choroidopathy, and you are going to achieve a good result with the clinical trials, so they don't start. So that's the reason, for instance, that in Japan, they never try to approve uh, photodynamic therapy as a treatment for AMD. Why? Because you have a lot of patients with this aggressive disease, and you are going to achieve a good result. Thank you very much. Um, I'm sure we have a lot of questions, but we can ask Dr. Rubius later on. But in the interest of time, and uh, as respectful to our speakers, so I'm going to ask Dr. Leila Jassim to come off. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum.
Okay, uh, I'm just going to give you today a short tips and uh, just a reminder about the glaucoma management in pregnancy. We all face such cases in our clinic and sometimes when the clinic is uh, heavy, we forget to ask the patient if she's pregnant and what medication we can use. Uh, the difficulty in managing glaucoma in pregnancy is uh, due to the lack of uh, data that support your decision in, uh, in the management steps. We are all familiar with uh, this FDA uh, categorizing of the drug that used in pregnancy. So just for the uh, short, uh, quick reminder, it all depends on clinical trial conducted on animals or in human. So A, uh, clinical trials or human uh, has shown its safety. B, animal trials are there, shows its safety, but there are no uh, human trial. C, animal trial has shown that it can cause harm to the fetus, but observational uh, study were not enough to support that in human. D, there is a risk of using the medication in pregnant lady, but sometimes uh, benefits may overweigh the, uh, outweigh the uh, potential risk. X are medication that are contraindicated in pregnancy at all, absolute contraindication. Most of our glaucoma medication are falling category C. So there are either animal uh, trials, uh, but there are no supportive uh, human trials to prove its safety or its harm, uh, harmfulness. So most of them have depended on uh, observational uh, studies. Uh, beta blocker has shown that it can cause a growth retardation if it's used in the first trimester. It also can cause uh, fetal bradycardia, so it's preferably not to be uh, used during the uh, last month of pregnancy, stop it ahead of labor, and put the uh, neonate after delivery in observation for a day or two. Carbonic anhydrase inhibitor, topical, has shown no uh, damage to the fetus. As for the systemic, uh, in animal uh, studies has shown that it can cause forelimb anomalies in rat, but then the dose that was uh, studied in rat, it was 10 times, 10 folds more than the dose that recommended to be used in human. Uh, human uh, studies observation has mostly, uh, the only case that was reported is a uh, sacrococcygeal teratoma in a newborn after the mother has used uh, diamox for the first half of pregnancy. Uh, there, uh, there is a very big observational prenatal uh, data of uh, more than 50,000 patients. 12 of them has used Diamox during the first trimester and no damage was found. Uh, just also remember that uh, Diamox can cause acidosis in the newborn, so if we are using it on the first trimester, it's better to put the patient, oh, sorry, the neonate for observation for a few days. Uh, prostaglandin analogs are used to induce labor and abortion, but then the dose that used is so much higher than the ophthalmic preparation. There, is, there was an observational study of 10 patients using Zalatan from first trimester, and one of the pregnancy ended up in abortion. So we don't use prostaglandin, usually avoid during the first trimester, avoid it in patients with a high-risk pregnancy, precious baby, status post-IVF, uh, patients with uh, habitual abortion, maybe you can use it later on uh, during the third trimester or closer to labor when you have a low risk pregnancy. Alpha 2 agonists are the safest. They are in group B where animal studies has not demonstrated any defects for the fetus teratogenic. But then remember, alpha GAN or uh, alpha agonist can close, uh, can cross the uh, blood placental barrier and blood brain barrier of the fetus. So you can induce CNS suppression and then the patient can end up, the neonate can end up in apnea after labor. So it's preferably not to be used closer to labor, stop it and then again put the neonate for observation for a few days after labor. Uh, my, myotics, parasympathomimetic, they showed no adverse effects on the fetus when it was used during pregnancy or on the neonate when the mother, when the lactating mother is using it. Mitomycin C, of course, it's X uh, category, so it's totally, absolutely contraindicated in pregnancy. The best way to manage pregnancy, uh, sorry, glaucoma during pregnancy is to pre-plan. Uh, most of our patients is having congenital glaucoma. They win, uh, they've been followed up since they were uh, young uh, kids. We usually tend to over-medicate them 
because always the intraocular pressure, we are not sure of its reliability. Child uncooperative, plus there is a problem with compliance issue, and we always under investigate them because they are not fit for visual field, still they can, cannot comprehend the test, and OCT cannot show the result for pediatric. So by the age of 18 or so, we can fully investigate the young lady and uh, set the level of her glaucoma and set the target intraocular pressure. We can taper or even stop all her medication and then introduce one by one, start with the least uh, contraindicated or least uh, favor uh, or the best favor for pregnancy so that uh, she will be uh, controlled on one and two medication. Maybe we can proceed with the surgery that overdue and we were postponing till the child will be older. But this is not the scenario. We, a lot of time we will face a patient that's pregnant and she's having glaucoma. And most of them will stop their glaucoma medication because on the leaflet uh, there is precaution to be used in, uh, in pregnancy or contraindicated. So the first thing the lady will do, she will stop her medication. And they come to emergency or to our clinic with a higher pressure. So just rem uh, remember that during pregnancy, it's two to three weeks after pregnancy until six to eight weeks uh, after labor, the pressure tends to drop down uh, due to hormonal changes, uh, cardiovascular changes, vasodilatation, or water retention, all this causes the pressure will go down and down until it stabilizes by the six to eight weeks after labor, and it will go back to its pre-pregnancy level when the patient usually stopped breastfeeding. And younger patients usually tolerate higher intraocular pressure than older ladies. And if we have a mild or moderate glaucoma with a pressure in the 20s, maybe we can, she can survive the few months of pregnancy without exposing her or the fetus to an extra risk by adding medication that are contraindicated or exposing her to surgery. So what choices do we have? Medication, as we said, we have to plan it according to the stage. So in the first trimester, avoid the uh, teratogenic, disease, uh, teratogenic drugs, avoid prostaglandins. Later on, uh, for example, in the pregnancy, maybe we can introduce even Diamox, we can introduce Zalatan, but then don't give uh, timolol and alpha gan when the patient is closer to labor. Pantal occlusion is a very good practice that everybody should practice it, especially pregnant ladies. 80% uh, of the drugs that we are using in, is ending up by passing through our nasolacrimal system into our, into our blood. So uh, by punctal occlusion, we can minimize or eliminate this, uh, this thing. And always advise the lady to have hospital delivery. Now it's very popular to have home delivery, but these patients, even if we stop Timolon and alpha gan and all glaucoma medication prior to labor, there is a problem. All glaucoma medication will go out of our system through urine. But the fetus has the, uh, he always recycle his urine. So when the medication will leave his system, this is not well known. So it's better to have hospital delivery to put the child for observation the new need for observation for a few days. SLT is a good option, it's safe, it's temporary effect. And, but the problem is not, uh, it's not indicated in childhood glaucoma. So it's contraindicated in congenital glaucoma, in anterior segment um, dysgenesis cases. Surgery carries a very high risk, general anesthesia. They are young, uh, young patients, so we need general anesthesia because uh, putting them through stress of uh, local anesthesia with the pregnancy, with the contraction. So there is no way we can do the surgery. Plus being a young patient to ensure the success rate of, uh, to improve the success rate of the glaucoma surgery, we will need to use anti which are contraindicated during pregnancy. So the best thing, whenever, <laughs> thank you very much. So the, uh, the best thing is, 
it's, uh, to discuss the case with a uh, with a young lady whenever she's turning 18 just tell her about the disease tell her about glaucoma medication that can affect your pregnancy or lactation but advise her that not to stop it because then it's again can affect her vision and she might lose her vision so it's uh, just tell her involve me in your pregnancy plans and your family plans uh, always remember to update social uh, status of the ladies okay are you pregnant lactating always review what happened during the last pregnancy so she went into 20s and she lost some of her uh, her optic disc cupping for example increase then it was a wrong management during that pregnancy we have to refine it now okay and always choose the timely manner of intervention uh, just remember that glaucoma surgery, absolute success of glaucoma surgery is have an expiration date. So maybe we'll do trabeculectomy and it fell in two, three, three years. So there is no use of doing it now. You can postpone it till the patient is planning to get pregnant and do it a few months ahead so that it can cover her pregnancy and her lactation period. And always remember, most of us are parents and we know that we always blame ourselves for the misfortune that happens to our kids. Uh, this is a mother with a glaucoma. She always worried that her kid gonna have a glaucoma and she ha she's the one who gave it to him. So explain the genetics of congenital glaucoma and here in Saudi, 90 something percent, 95 to 98 percent is uh, related to one gene and it's always autosomal recessive. So she either can do genetic counseling before like engaged or married, and if she's married, it's plain to both couples so that if the child will have congenital glaucoma, it wouldn't be the mother who's to blame from the society and to have the guilt. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Chasson. This is a very important lecture, actually. We often forget about you know what we can use and not use, so this is actually a very nice uh, synopsis. Any uh, question? Uh, shortly for Dr. Jassim. Do you have any question? Maybe, maybe Dr. Jassim, I can ask you to maybe like circulate the table that you have, that you made in, in an email to residency. That would be nice because like it's a, you know, sheet that we can have uh, or on our phone or something. It's a good, good reminder. Thank you very, very much. Okay. Um, thank you. Okay, Dr. Mura is next. Uh, he will talk about uh, his presentation about macular hole in, with retinal detachments and I believe scleral buckling in macular hole retinal detachments. Good afternoon, thank you very much. I'm gonna be talking about surgical approach for myopic macular holes with retinal detachment. So this is the scenario we can find uh, when we're dealing with macular holes and uh, uh, in eye myopic. Uh, we can have, as a first uh, uh, slide on the left, we can have myopic macular holes and have an associated retinal detachment with it. We can have a macular hole with a retinal detachment and skysis, or we can have a simple macular hole without detachment. What are the most important and most challenging to treat are the first two on the left, when retinal detachment is associated with or without skysis. <clears throat> here, here are some facts about myopic macular holes. Uh, it is a cause, as I told you, of retinal detachment. It's quite infrequent, except in the Asian population. Uh, it's about 0.54% cause of retinal detachment in the uh, Caucasian, but uh, uh, up to 21% in the uh, Japanese and Chinese population. Uh, I have no idea about the statistics in Saudi Arabia, but we encounter several uh, high myops with this condition. Um, predisposing factors are, of course, uh, the um, severity of eye myopia. The higher uh, is the axial length, the longer is the eye, the uh, more uh, prone are those eyes to get uh, retinal detachment. Uh, Sometimes they uh, arise after a severe blunt trauma that it creates anterior posterior attraction and uh, detachment. Retina, starting from the macular hole. They usually have a bad visual prognosis in spite of surgery. Um, uh, it's a little bit uh, better in the cases without retinal detachment, of course. In those cases, macular holes uh, occur early uh, in, the, in age uh, compared to the opatic macular hole. Uh, surgical results here are uh, as also poor, but uh, better than uh, when you compare with the regmatogen retinal detachment associated. And uh, um, when the surgical technique is not appropriate, they may. Uh, 
and uh, at, uh, um, in uh, eye myops with macular hole. Um, um, we know that the ILM in this type of patient is different. They've been studied and done in Japan in the ILM in this patient by the group of Ishibashi, uh, which show the difference of this ILM when compared to idiopathic macular holes. And in particular, uh, these patients uh, have um, a higher um, rate of uh, um, cellular debris and collagen deposition at the, uh, uh, in, in the ILM when it's um, uh, analyzed and uh, ultra, um, uh, in, uh, in microscopy. Um, also, one of the possibility is uh, one of the pathogenetic factors, of course, uh, the, the shape of the eye. Uh, the staphyloma. Uh, the staphyloma in this eye myops uh, give rise to two problems. Uh, one is the um, posterior vitreous structure, so traction on the vitreous because of the length of the eye itself, and one is the stretching of the retinal arteries. You know that the retinal vessels, as shown here in this uh, OCT, in these eye myops, uh, you can see that the stretching of these vessels, and uh, it, because the retina is very thin, most of the time what happens is that uh, there are little holes, sometimes little holes, they create uh, on the edges of these uh, uh, stiff vessels and create little small inner uh, retinal breaks uh, through what uh, water and fluid can go inside and can basically hydrate the inner retinal space. Once the inner retinal space is hydrated, the RP pumps in these patients doesn't work optimally due to the RP atrophy, so it can end up having a, a massive macular detachment. Um, Uh, just this to remember the fellows that there are several types of uh, staphyloma. Uh, the first one to describe was Curtin and Bascom Palmer. Uh, there are uh, like uh, um, uh, 10 types of staphyloma. These are the most important one, the most related to the macular hole, the one you see down here, type 2, type uh, f uh, 6, 1, uh, 3, uh, type 10, uh, and type 9. Uh, all of them have different uh, um, uh, configuration, and all of them are associated with uh, um, uh, plus minus um, foveal atrophy. And that's, I think, the most important factor, uh, the atrophic uh, changes the posterior pole. And, and most of the studies, actually, as we will see later, are not, is not taken into consideration in the surgical uh, planning. <clears throat> We know that uh, regarding macular hole in general, and of course also for myopic macular holes, um, big advantage has been done uh, with the paspinal vitrectomy. The man you see there left is not my father, it's just Robert Macamer, is uh, the inventor of vitrectomy. Uh, since Robert Macamer invented the vitrectomy, um, a lot of advantages uh, came, um, and the major one was done in 1991 by Kelly Wandel, which described for the first time the LM peeling for the treatment of the macular hole. After that, uh, all of you younger surgeons, they know that uh, nowadays retina surgery became easier, it became sutureless, um, the, the gauge of the instruments decreased, uh, the recovery time increased uh, in the patient, uh, there were new molecules came out for the staining of the, of the retinal tissue, they made surgery easier, uh, new tamponade, the advent of the OCT, and especially in, in this case, especially for the topic I'm, uh, I'm uh, talking about today, uh, new surgical techniques, especially macular buckle and ILM flap. Recently also retina patch, but I will not talk about it because I think it's a separate, uh, separate um, uh, topic and uh, really not applicable, uh, not applicable in my view for macular hole. So this is um, uh, what is reported in the literature about myopic macular retinal detachment. These are the uh, studies um, that uh, report the Sussex rate with paspinal vitrectomy without ILM flap. Uh, all of you know this type of macular are more difficult to treat. Uh, macular closure rate, you see it variates based on the study in this population type between 10 and almost 70 percent. So there is a huge variation. I think the variation has to do with the surgical technique used. Uh, as I told you, there is no really consensus on the technique, and also there is not a real well-classified cl um, systematic approach to it, um, especially because of the atrophy component. And uh, the reattachment rates, and it goes also very spread between uh, 43 and 100 percent. Uh, some studies 100 percent anatomic reattachment, but this um, uh, this is uh, a reattachment sometimes, it doesn't mean that the hole is closed, it means the retina is attached, but most of the time, sometimes in these cases, you can have a reattachment of the retina, but the macular hole stays, stays open. These are some of the studies that came out recently. It is uh, about uh, eye myopic macular hole and inverted flap technique. Uh, it was described for the first time by Jersey Avroki group in, uh, in Poland. And after that, uh, several papers came out. And as I told you, all the, the common denominator of all this paper is uh, um, basically 
uh, the following. Uh, most of them are retrospective studies. Um, most of them are small case series, actually. Um, the eye myopic, uh, the, the axial length of the patient usually is more than 26 millimeter, but there is no really cutoff and um, no really indication based on axial length in the, in the literature yet. Um, the macro closure um, rate in with using LM pulp technique is uh, between 80 and 80 and percent as you can see uh, with the advent of the LM flap the closure of these holes is increased uh, consistently uh, if you compare to the technique without uh, without uh, uh, LM flap um, but as I told you before, uh, the area of atrophy, uh, atrophy RP is not taken into consideration. Uh, most of those papers, when you go around and you look in the inclusion criteria, they talk about axial length, uh, but ne they never talk about presence of atrophy. And uh, as I showed you before, all the staphylomas are different. So this atrophy sometimes is located at the fovea, sometimes is located perifovially, and sometimes these macular holes actually with retinal detachment are not foveal, but are parafoveal. Uh, most of the time in the correspondence of the atrophic area, which is actually the place where the retina is thinner. I think that is the main uh, difference why you have this spread in the, in the Sussex rate, and uh, I want to show you some uh, tricks to be able to, to, to um, address uh, this, this problem, especially when there is atrophy. Um, because when there is no atrophy, the technique is nowadays quite standard, and it is just a pars plana vitrectomy with uh, yeah, that's what, what, um, what we used in this little study we did in publishing Retina. It was a multicentric study done uh, by um, where myself was also involved. Uh, I was publishing Retina last year, and uh, we used a uh, standard technique, Paspana vitrectomy 360 flap, so the flap taken from all over around the area of the, of the disc. Uh, we didn't do ILM tucking, so, um, and we didn't drain from the hole. Um, uh, so we just did the flap, we left it in place, and, uh, and we... Um, and we did that for this change. This is a video uh, just to show you the technique. It's an eye myopic hole. Uh, you see also here at the location of the, of the hole, there is the atrophies around, but where the hole is located, there is still RP. And that, uh, that, makes, uh, that makes the difference. We stay in with the blue always, um, as we do also here in Kekesh. And then uh, you see with the blue, sometimes if the, if the media are clear, the, the, the view is, is, is reasonable. Uh, but sometimes it is a lot of atrophy is very difficult to see even where the hole is located. Um, it can be challenging even staining with blue. Very important in this patient is to remove the peritoneal membrane. The peritoneal membrane are quite extensive. Usually they, they are diffused in the whole posterior pole up to the vascular arcade. So you have to remove all these membranes like I'm doing here because this membrane creates tangential traction. So the peeling in macular hole related retinal detachment has to be the broadest possible. So extend it up to the arterioles and even further outside of the staphyloma, so that you have all the uh, traction, tangential traction uh, release. Once this is done, we just leave, we shorten a little bit with the vitrector, the, the flap, and then we do air food exchange. Usually the staphyloma is in the most, the, the optic nerve is in the most declined position, and uh, the, there is no need to stuff inside the, the, um, uh, the, the ILM, and it creates also some iatrogenic damage. If you do that, so better don't do it, better don't go close to the, to the hole. And this is the OCT intraoperative, which you see, uh, where well, it doesn't work, uh, here. Where you see that uh, the flap is just lying on the top of the retina, but is not inside, stuffed inside. This is under air, okay? So you see here the, uh, the flap. You can see it here very well. Let me stop with a screenshot of this. You can see it here is lying, it's not been stuffed inside, it's not drained, so there is still fluid under the retina. You can see the results are quite good. You don't need, uh, you can close, uh, as I said, 80 to 100% of the cases in this way when the RP is not atrophic at the edge, at the level of the hole itself. And uh, once you do this technique as we did without stuffing inside the ILM, you have also the best visual acuity result. What you can see here on the left side is a closed pattern with the glial tissue formation, which you usually have it when you do the uh, tucking of the ILM inside the hole, which I personally, I think, don't like. Also, because, as I said, it gives less uh, um, uh, good visual prognosis. And this is uh, the, our technique without uh, stuffing inside. Uh, the ILM, and you can see that there is a pretty normal um, reformation of the uh, inner and outer retinal layer uh, as of the, in the, in the patient. Um, 
uh, when severe diffuse atrophy is present at the location of the break, the situation is different. The, as I said, the, the negative pressure of the created by the pump of the RPE pump is not present anymore, so it's more difficult to close these holes. Um, usually what happens is that you manage maybe to close the hole intraoperatively. Maybe with silicon oil you will have good result, but uh, sometimes when then you go and remove the silicon oil, the fact that the hole is still present, there is no RPE pump effect, uh, you get a redetachment. Um, so this is uh, um, what we did some time ago when I still was in Amsterdam. Uh, we had a series of patients and we, um, we operated them with this technique with the macular buckle. Uh, these are the great uh, uh, drawings of my fellow at that time, which gave us uh, the cover page of British Journal of Ophthalmology. Uh, it's very, very, very good with the uh, uh, digital uh, uh, drawing. And um, I really think in this patient with RP atrophy at the break, at the whole location, macular buckle is a, is a better option. Um, uh, it works uh, reshaping the posterior staphyloma, um, it's creating, uh, releasing the anterior posterior traction, and uh, it gives a good anatomical and functional result. In our study, 90.5% per 90 closure rate and 71.4% 70 visual improvement, visual acute improvement. Um, it was a retrospective study. We did 21 eye myopic eyes. Um, these are the patient distribution. 11 were whole with macular detachment, uh, whole with skysis and detachment, and five uh, without um, uh, macular skysis, only simple macular hole in eye myopic patients with, the, uh, with the atrophy. Um, this is the mean age. Uh, this is the axial length. The axial length was uh, between 28 to 78 millimeter and 35.9, so almost 36 millimeter, very large eyes. Um, follow up um, average seven months between three and 19 months. <coughs> Our primary outcome was a complete closure of the macro roll and reattachment of the retina. It was actually not even visual acuity, but we, we, we achieved uh, improvement. This is a patient table. What you see here that uh, um, about half of those patients were operated before. Okay, these are all patients with macular detachment uh, or uh, uh, macular roll macular detachment or macular roll um, with macular skies and detachment. And uh, they were operated before with PPV, ILM peeling, and silicon oil. This is the first line you see here in red. Uh, after removing silicon oil, the retina redetached, and we had to apply the macular buckle in all those cases, uh, the third sign in blue. And what you see here in green are the cases which were operated primarily by PPV and macular buckle together. You can see here that uh, some of the patients were operated previously twice. For example, this patient here, this patient here. Um, we try again in, in injecting oil to solve the problem, it didn't work, so we always end up doing multiple surgery to be able to, to, to flatten the retina and to keep the retina attached after silicone removal. While the cases we did, the primary buckle and PPV together, uh, some of them require only gas uh, of use, some of them oil, but even with gas, with single procedure, we, may, we were able to, to close the hole and to reestablish anatomical um, um, uh, results. This is the reason why I think our buckle is better than some of the buckles present in the commerce, in the, in the, in the market, sorry. Um, um, what you see on your left is uh, a study published by Carlos Mateo from, uh, from Spain, from Barcelona. Uh, is um, one of the pioneers of this technique. But uh, he, he, um, you see here what, what, what happens. These are the pre-op, these are the post-ops, pre-op, post-op. What happens with this type of buckle you use, which is a rigid titanium buckle, is that you create basically an, uh, I, I like to call it, iatrogenic dome-shaped maculopathy. There is a very big compression to be able to, to release the traction. And what happens is that here with time you create uh, like compression of the choroid and you create uh, like ischemia. Uh, it's the same thing you have, it happens when you, when you put an encircling band and you tighten it too much. Uh, the sclera just slowly get compressed, and because of that you can get erosion of the sclera, compression of the vasculature, and uh, um, long term it may even end up having like uh, um, intrusion in, uh, of the buckle. That's what happened on the right is what happens with our buckle, which is adjustable. Uh, you can really adjust it uh, real time. I have a video of it I will show you. You can adjust it real time, uh, the tension, and you can uh, suture it in place based on the tension you want. Um, in, in theory, you can do that uh, intraoperative with intraoperative OCT if you, uh, if you like, or just visually during the technique. And you never have this, um, these are three, three cases of us, and you have, uh, never have this uh, um, uh, iatrogenic dome-shaped maculopathy like you see in the, in the left uh, picture. This is how the buckle is, looks like. Uh, it is a um, uh, seven millimeter silicon uh, macular plate, 
which is this one. This is a seven millimeter, and two millimeter is like the, the compressive plate here. In the middle, there is a little hole where you just slide inside the 240 band. Um, this, the uh, um, proximal part of the buckle is sutured under the um, lateral rectus muscle, so you don't need to have any uh, muscle disinsertion. There is no posterior suturing. You just suture this uh, end on the, under the um, rectus um, uh, lateralis. You slide the 240 band under the inferior oblique, and you suture it on the, inf uh, on the inferior rectus, one end, and the other end you use to um, adjust the uh, indentation. Once you reach the desired indentation, you can suture it on the tendon of the um, superior uh, rectus, and then you, you, um, you have the desired effect. Um, uh, some possible um, cons of this, uh, this buckle, uh, compared to others in the commerce, is the possible diplopia. I must say we had one patient with a transient diplopia the first day after surgery, uh, probably due to the manipulation to find the inferior oblique. Um, it, it resolves spontaneously. Of course, I, I like every other buckle, you can have extrusion, but it's a common complication of all the other uh, buckles also. Uh, you can have a subretinal hemorrhage uh, with the suturing, also complication common of the buckles, so nothing new. And uh, what you can have with this, uh, which is a bit uh, uh, unusual for normal scalar buckling, is the choroidal hemorrhage. Um, the reason why you can have this is because once you uh, pass the band, uh, the 240 band, uh, from the inferior uh, rectus to the superior rectus, you have to make sure not to uh, compress the exit of the vortex vein. Okay, so some people just put it there, they tie it, and then they come back, they look inside, there's a choroidal hemorrhage. You have you really to pass it under the vortex vein, to be uh, to avoid it. that's the only trick uh, the, the 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 inferior oblique um, uh, localization and the vortex vein localization is the only trick once you master uh, this uh, this step uh, the, the actually the operation is quite simple <clears throat> this is one OCT that shows you there is uh, with the buckle present in uh, in situ i can show you here you see it very good uh, this is an adi image uh, you see the buckle is here inside this is the buckle which is pressing but there is no dome shape effect and that's the advantage of this type of buckle compared to others. Okay, so where is the next? Okay, yeah. This is the video. <coughs> so you see you isolated, you isolated the, the, the four red tie muscles like uh, you would do in a normal buckle procedure. The extra step is finding the uh, oblique, which is uh, this one here. Usually it's in the, in the fat, in the, in the, in the uh, inferonasal quadrant. You just uh, isolate it so you can pass under the uh, inferior oblique your band and also you have to make sure as I told you not to engage the, the exit of the vortex vein you just pass it under and then you suture it the um, distal end to the okay now I'm passing superiorly sorry I'm passing under the um, lateral rectus of the oblique of the sorry of the inferior rectus you see the inferior rectus now is sutured the tendon inferior rectus is sutured to the buckle we put another extra suture for, uh, for security. So the inferior part is suture. And it doesn't move anymore. It's a fixed point. <coughs> this is the, uh, the, the proximal end, which we then at the end we will suture on the superior, uh, on the superior rectus. You see, we, we can visualize, actually, here, even if the break is not at the fovea here or is here, you can just locate where you want and you are visually actually compre you visually pull on the uh, uh, proximal end and you see where the buckle is located, okay? So uh, once you desired a little bit of, um, in this case, for example, it was eccentric hole. Then so once you find the right, it was, uh, it was, uh, it was a little bit uh, uh, inferior. And then once you find the right uh, tension, you just suture the, um, the, the proximal end to the um, uh, proximal end to the to the tendon of the of the superior rectus. It's more complicated to explain it to you than see it in real because all these muscles uh, names. Okay. So in conclusion, um, when uh, you have a um, macular hole. Um, in eye myopic with a reasonable amount of RPE and no atrophy, I think uh, vitrectomy with the ILM flap is probably the best way to go. Um, when there is atrophy and, uh, or when there is a hole which is not central but paracentral in the scotoma, it becomes challenging with vitrectomy. Uh, so in, in that case, especially because of the presence of atrophy, uh, in that case, I think macular buckle has an added value. 
and uh, the technique is not too difficult. You need to be masterized. Of course, you need to do some of them first. Uh, in the first case, maybe we should ask uh, some of the pediatric ophthalmology to be there because it's not easy for us to, to find the inferior oblique. Um, and uh, in those cases, probably buckle needs to be associated with paraspinal vitrectomy, which can be done with gas also, not necessarily with oil, uh, to increase the Sussex rate. Thank you very much. Uh, are, uh, you can do also that without vitrectomy. For, um, you can use a chandelier light to illuminate, or because I think with the indirect, uh, yeah, it can do it even indirect, but I think you're precise if you use a chandelier and an indirect visualization system. Uh, but you can do it without vitrectomy, yes. I did also without vitrectomy also. How many uh, cases you have done? Very nice cases. Uh, here, this study was here, 21. And, and, in Kekesh, Kekesh. With Kekesh, unfortunately, we never did. For a simple reason, we never managed to get uh, the, the buckle uh, <laughs> uh, order. I tried to, to, to request it a long time ago, uh, but there was not a company who would basically uh, distribute it in, in situ. So um, maybe if it keep being like this, I should just take some samples from Europe next time I go, because otherwise it's not even difficult. But uh, this study was 21 cases. I did probably together with um, this, this study. This what I did, I did after learning curve. So I did more uh, before. When I felt comfortable, we start basically doing uh, the, the study. So I did in total uh, 35, 36 cases. I don't recall exactly the number. Hmm. Is, is there a, uh, any, are there any cases in which the buckle kind of um, goes into the sclera and thins the sclera a little bit more? And, um, look, this myopia is, uh, there was a case, it was 37 millimeter. So there you need, need to be very, very careful because the sclera is super thin. Um, so uh, to be honest with you, it didn't occur to me. Um, it occurred to me once that I placed it in the wrong place. So then I had to remove the suture. And uh, you could see the sclera was not uh, very happy about it because you could still see the tracks of the, of, the, um, of, the, of the needle insertion. So then it's difficult to find a place where to put it again. So the best is to make your measurement correct once, so to avoid that. Uh, but no intrusion so far, no. These cases are from now some years ago, uh, so the follow-up is longer than what I have here. But unfortunately, since uh, when I left, I didn't have a chance to, to get uh, the, the follow-up back. Um, but it happens to me to talk to my colleagues in Amsterdam, and they never tell me that they saw patients back with problems. Um, yeah. Besides the anatomic success, do patients feel the difference? Yes, patients feel the difference. Uh, as I said, there was also visual improvement. I didn't point very much on the visual improvement because uh, mainly the result of the study was about uh, closing the holes. And, but there was a 70% improved vision. I mean, the visual improvement is not uh, 2020, okay? <laughs> there are patients who see uh, end motions and maybe they see 2200, 2400, you know, or 2300. There is a minimal improvement, but there is a, there is a shift. There is a minimal improvement, yes. Can OCT be used to guide where you put yes, the buckle? Yes, OCT can be used to guide. At that time, I didn't have it, so I couldn't do it. Uh, but uh, it can, the OCT can be helpful to understand how much you have to depress. Because if you saw the images of uh, Carlos Mateo, they are, they are actually, I mean, this is, this is a iatrogenic damage for me. It's too much indentation. Um, and it creates long-term for sure problem. You, you, everybody did buckle, so you know what happens when a long-term uh, eye compression uh, applies to the sclera. You get uh, thinning, you get uh, scleromalacia, and this happens also at the posterior pole. Mm -hmm. So uh, I don't like to, de to depress so much. It has to be minimal. <clears throat> Do you have any questions? Dr. Yepes, would you like to present your case? Is it 10 minutes or is it longer? 10 minutes, OK. okay. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip my case. We're going to hear from Dr. Yepes. The fact. The fact that we don't have, except I guess, one case presentation by the residents. Do we have one or two? Two? Okay, so uh, we'll do Dr. Yepes. I'll skip my case and then I'll give you the quiz. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Muran, to everybody who participated today. Thank you, Dr. Anavlati. That's a great opportunity to be here.
This is the multicenter study, uh, the bilateral sequential vitrectomy. I would like to put the light off, please. Okay, this patient has a torch syndrome and um, bilateral cataract and bilateral giant ear. I would like to show how I manage this patient. Right, I start doing the phase commodification. Uh, the patient already has uh, the uh, IOL calculation two months ago. I performed vitrectomy, uh, phase commodification in the usual manner. But rather than using the light microscope, I like to use 23-gauge and the illuminator, because this provides me a, a better visualization, like something like a 3D uh, resolution, and then I put the intracular lens. I started the vitrectomy using the 23-gauge, and so, I found this uh, giant here in this patient in the, in the left eye. Um, I started, uh, the idea is to remove all the peripheral vitreous, uh, um, put the peripheral carbon. You can see there two or three uh, toxoplasmosis uh, scar. Um, also, we, we, we can uh, rule out Icardi syndrome. And then it's very important to remove all the fibrotic tissue at the periphery. periphery. And then we need to remove the peripheral carbon bubble to avoid in the postoperative uh, subretinal bubble. We can also use the transinolone to help us to visualize better the vitreous. And then we add more peripheral carbon until the peripheral carbon reach the retinal border. And then I apply laser 360 degree to create something like the new aura serrata. I, I, I also apply the laser in the scar, taking into consideration some paper that <coughs> you can have a reactivation of the toxoplasmosis after surgery. <clears throat> but in recent paper published last year, the doctor couldn't find any relationship, any reactivation after parplanar vitrectomy, either parplanar or phacal mystification. I moved to the right eye, to the fellow eye. But before to do this, I, we need to change everything related to the every uh, tour vitrectomy, something like this, phacal mystification. I perform the phacal uh, aspiration in the same. The idea is to reduce the, uh, the amount of light that impact the macula. As you can see here, you, the, 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 we have more impression, like 3D resolution. Uh, for me, it's better using this uh, lateral illumination rather than the light, microscope light, because microscope produces some elim eliminate the shadow. So uh, when I enter the eye, I, I found these more complicated cases, uh, giant ear with PBR. Also, you can see two uh, toxoplasma scar, inferior and superior here. How I manage this? OK, we be patient and remove our Bitter hemorrhage. Now, using the more uh, a new uh, instrumentation for vitrectomy, different kind of machine, you can perform this surgery in less time than the 
done before. For example, uh, I remember it took me no more than two hours performing combined fake and vitrectomy um, silicone oil with the patient with giant here. Then the idea here is to remove all the fibrotic tissue, as you can see. We can apply diatermy to, to reduce the, the risk of bleeding because reading, uh, we, we can, reading is no good idea for a patient with a giant tear to, because it increases the risk of proliferative bitter retinopathy in the postoperative period. period. Um, then I perform air fluid exchange. Some doctors can perform uh, silicone or hyperfluorocarbon to reduce the, the risk of slippage, but I, I, I didn't find this in my patient. Air fluid the chain, as you can see, and also I apply 360 degrees because uh, there is uh, some paper that we can reduce the risk of redetachment. And six months after this, uh, I removed the silicone oil, one eye first, and then in the second, and the patient improved uh, his visual acuity. So. We can perform sequest, uh, bilateral sequential metrectomy when the patient have condition that needs surgery, for example, uh, bilateral retinal detachment or t t TRD affecting the macula. Um, so now we can do this. Um, the time to, to perform this, uh, you, you can reduce this dramatically using the, the new machine. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Always interesting, doctor. Thank you very much, Joan. But this is also comes for the same idea of doing uh, sequential phaco emulsification for right. one patient. The main problem who are uh, against it is that the development of infection, endophthalmitis. You're and right. This is a main issue. Uh, that's why it is uh, now in most of the hospitals it's very limited to do uh, same setting sequential. Yeah. So uh, why you did uh, in your case? Uh, this patient had tort syndrome, okay, uh, mental disability. But we had to take some measures to reduce the risk. For example, uh, there is a paper written by Dr. Mar Speaker in uh, Ophthalmology 2002. He found that the microorganisms, the DNA of the microorganisms in the vitro samples are similar to the conjunctiva. So we need the measure of the, the infection if uh, are coming from the, the conjunctiva. You, you, uh, I apply betadine at the beginning, betadine at the uh, at, at the end. Uh, also, uh, there is the paper in retina that you can apply uh, uh, topical anesthesia can reduce uh, the risk of endothermitis because it uh, can kill the microorganism. Also, uh, I inject intrastroma uh, several times instead of uh, intracamera because according to our research, intrastroma, you can have more uh, amount of uh, antibiotic in the anterior chamber rather than uh, in, in when you inject in the anterior chamber. But you are right, there is a risk. Yeah, because we uh, have to take also, risk. As you know, that also can come from uh, solutions, in fact, solution. Yeah. That's why they are now in some hospitals, they, it is limited for certain cases only uh, to do same case sequential. Uh, well, especially in fake uh during the last seven years, I have been injecting intrastroma. I perform uh, uh, OCT um, pachymetry in this patient. I found that uh, you can have m or at least four days uh, an important amount of in, uh, intracameral uh, antibiotic after intrastromal. Uh, there is a paper written by a doctor from England that you have, uh, when you inject in the intracameral, just uh, the antibiotic lasts no more than one and a half day. For this reason, for, for, for me, the intrastroma is better. Thank you. Are there any more questions? No? Thank you very much. Oh, I you. appreciate it. Thank you very much.
somebody help me to to take off the video and maybe um, not sure how to do this. Yes. Um, escape. There we go. Okay. All right. We're gonna be doing the quiz. So I ask you please to stay and I want you all to come forward. Uh, all the residents please come forward. I would like the uh, the fellows, Inviteretinal fellows also to take the quiz, even if you don't get any marks, but it's, it's a teaching experience. So please come forward and I would like you to sit, not together, but with two seats in between you guys I'm gonna I'm gonna treat you like my children, so so please do not uh, no no sitting together no sitting together. You're going to I would like to have a real clear idea of what it is that you know. And um, so no sitting together, please. You come forward, all the way, please, ladies. Those who don't comply, I'm gonna take the paper away, and it's gonna be a no mark. So please go ahead. Um, don't sit together. You're going to have two, one or two seats in between, one or two people per row. Por favor, in Spanish, since we just came from Barcelona. Um, I'm going to ask you to come forward, please. Please come forward all the way. In the front, sit next to Dr. Lamru. He may be able to help you. Good idea. Please come forward more. Are, is that all? Are, you, are there more residents? Are there, yes, please, please, take papers, yes. Yes, okay. Um, all right, this is a long quiz, but the thing is, is that the answers are really short. They're usually like one or two words, that's it, okay? And uh, the hope is that at the end, you guys come out with some practical information for you. All right, so. Are you all set? Are you all sitting? I'm see okay, I, I want you to come forward here and I want you to move a little bit, please. You guys are sitting too close to each other and I, I can hear you speak. So please come forward so I don't have to shout also. All right, there are still more people coming. Come on people, we need to start. Okay. Please avoid talking. The whole idea here is to learn. Okay, this is a quiz that I've given exactly five years ago. So most of you have not seen it, but I think this is uh, a practical quiz that I hope you will use in your, in your practice. And it really relates to using the indirect ophthalmoscopy. I find that most people now are using just the 78 to 90 lens. Uh, the art of using indirect ophthalmoscopy is not mastered. I would love for you to be able to, you know, you do it more and more, because you cannot look at the retina just looking at the posterior pole and the mid-periphery. You have to look at the whole retina, otherwise, you know, you're not doing a good job. All right, so, question one, you have the numbers. Just a simple question. Which diagram is anatomically correctly oriented? Which diagram is anatomically correctly oriented? I want you to look at the periphery of the retina, and I want you to look at the orientation of the macula and the optic disc. And you tell me which is correct, which doesn't make sense. It's a simple answer. It's A or B. Okay. You should know it by now. Number two. I want you to label the structures from A to D E. So I want you to label the structure, which is also here. I want you to label this structure, this linear structure, which is also here. I want you to label this pointy lesion, which is here, and this round lesion, 
here and I want you to tell me what this is. So you have five landmarks, no cheating. Some of the ex-fellows are talking. Please, Dr. Saidi, there are resonance behind you. No, no talking, I don't. I really would like to read your responses and know how much you know so that we can move forward and help you out with that. Okay, so I think it's pretty clearly indicated. Just write the name of the structure that you see in this anatomical drawing of the retina. This is basic anatomy. Shall I move on? Okay, I'll count to three and then we'll move on. The 20 diopter lens. I want you to give me an A. What is the magnification? In B, I want you to give me either, if you don't know, the degrees, how many degrees of view, or how many disc diopter do you see when you focus with a 20 diopter lens and look at the fundus? What is the size of the retina that you see in disc areas? when you look with a 20 diopter lens. And I want you to tell me what is the working distance from the cornea. Okay, so there are very short answers actually. My dad, Allah used to say, there's nothing easy or hard. You know it, it's easy. You don't, it's hard. So if you know it, write it down. If you don't, guess. And then we will go over this and hopefully you will remember it. So what is the magnification? What is the field of view? And what's the working distance? Question number four. You have four structures in the periphery of the retina. These are common features of the peripheral retina that we saw in the lecture of anatomy. A, this thing here. B, this thing here. C, this thing here. And D, this thing here. So what is the name of these four lesions? And which one or ones from these predispose to retinal detachment? hearing some whispers. Please avoid talking to each other. You got that? Five simple questions. All right. Now, question number five. You have four types of peripheral retinal degenerations. A, B, C, and D. What is the name of A, B, C, and D? What is the name of the peripheral degeneration? Which one or ones predispose to RD? And this particular one, A, what is the prevalence of this particular degeneration in the elderly population?
done? Do you need more time? Okay, I'll wait. to pass to the next question now there is one single peripheral re degeneration that you see in all these pictures so if one picture is not clear look at the other pictures they all represent the same lesion okay there are different pictures of different patient size but of the same thing 